And if Europe does, quote unquote, run out of energy this winter, that's what powers an economy, right? So obviously less energy, less economic output. And so your question you're raising, which is the right one, which is, okay, so how much impact is there going to be to the economy? And what's interesting is you can make an argument that it would be deflationary or disinflationary because of the slowing growth. But at the same time, if it disrupts key supply chains, then that can give us that cost push inflation. I think it's in the system today. I think it's much more inflationary. So yes, you could say, well, Europe, you know, moving off the consumption grid would be deflationary, but let's not kid ourselves that Europe has been a big source of growth and a big source of consumption for the world for the past 20 years. You know, European growth has been lackluster for two decades uh, now. So it's, you know, Europe falling into recession, you're moving from plus 0.5% growth to minus two or minus three. Now, of course, it's not great for global demand, don't get me wrong, but uh, the supply chain dislocation factor for me is much more of a concern than a potential deflationary hit coming from Europe. The one way Europe could be end up being deflationary is all of this would trigger an abs- a further collapse in the euro. I mean, w- you know, the euro, if it's not in a free fall, it's starting to approach one. And you know, if you run out of energy, then then you move into you move into full freefall, which incidentally would further fuel Europe's domestic inflation rates. So, no, Europe, I think, is a, is an extremely dangerous place to to have capital deployed today. I got a question. I want to tie this to, but first, put on your bullish hat for Europe. Like, what's what could happen that would make that would improve Europe's prospects from here? I mean, I guess maybe one of them would be kind of just a magical, you know truce that appears between them and Russia, and all of a sudden, you know, they start getting a lot more cheaper energy. Is there any other development than that, that that could make a more bullish case for Europe's prospects? Europe is facing an energy crisis. So any way, any way that gets resolved is positive. Uh, So what are the ways that uh, that Europe energy crisis gets resolved? Yes. One of them is somehow you know, Europe, once again, is able to get a bunch of cheap energy from Russia, either because the Putin government falls or because Europe decides, you know what, not committing economic suicide is actually more important to us than than the Ukrainians, or, you know, wh- whatever the reason, Europe will need this energy. Uh, there's another way, actually, that Europe could potentially get all this energy is, um, Europe to do what China decided to do last summer and what India decided to do uh, also last summer and turn back to coal. Uh, you know, coal is by far the cheapest way to produce electricity uh, by, by a long shot. Uh, but today, unfortunately, Europe has basically decided to fight a two pronged war. Now, you would think that all the Germans who work at the European Commissions would know that fighting two, two, two front wars don't work. You think um, they would have learned that lesson? That, yeah, exactly. You, you would think they'd know it by now, but obviously they don't. And uh, Europe has decided to fight uh, a war against Putin on the one hand and a war against climate change on the other. That's, one, that's at least one war too many. And as long as Europe continues to say we're fighting a two-front war, uh, you cannot deploy capital there. Now, if Europe in the coming months says, you know what, we're no longer fi- having to fight Russia or we're no longer having to fight climate change, then you can start deploying capital there again. But until then, you know, until then, Europe is confronting a massive energy crisis. Okay, great. So just to summarize, your your, your prospects, given the status quo or, or the outlook, is not good. And you'd basically, you know, painting with a broad brush here, you wouldn't be deploying capital there until they decide to at least downshift to a one-front war. Okay. By, the way, there's some, by the way, there's some indication of that. You know, Germany is, you know, reopening uh, coal, coal fire power of coal-based plants. They're starting to re-import coal from South Africa, re-import coal from Australia, which of course, needless to say, is an ecological disaster, right? Right, Bringing coal all the way from Australia, like all the way, like put it in ships and shipping it literally across the world is about as ungreen as, as you could imagine. You know, that's, that's the internal contradictions we now have to, to, to accept in Europe. Yeah. And I'm asking you to speculate here. Um, You're not, necessarily a European energy policy, you know, specialist. Um, I'm sure uh-huh. you've got some 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 expertise and understanding yeah. it though. But uh, you know, Germany is still continuing to decommission its nuclear plants. Do you potentially foresee them eventually reversing that decision or is that is that a permanent fatality of their current climate it's change a, work? It's a- it's a permanent fatality of having the Green Party uh, as part of a ruling coalition in Germany. Um, okay. So you, 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 know, don't, the, you don't see that being reversed. Uh, 
until this government falls, no. Uh, yeah. You know, the Green Party in Germany uh, has always been deeply, deeply anti-nuclear, uh, which is, you know, odd because if you're against climate change and if you're worried about carbon emissions, actually nuclear is the answer and not, not the enemy. Uh, but for the Green Party in Germany, nuclear has always been the enemy. So as long as the Green Party is in power, they're going to keep decommissioning the nuclear plants. It's okay. nuts, but there you have it. If you enjoyed this video clip, click here to watch another one you should like.